Well, we're back with Off the Press. Jide Johnson joins us this morning on uh, the show via Zoom. Jide, it's good to have you join us. Happy uh, good, good Friday. Good, good morning and um, um, happy Good Friday to all our viewers all over the world. And Ramadan Karim to our Muslim brothers that are still fasting. It's a pleasure. And sisters that are still fasting. It's a pleasure to be with you on a Good Friday. Yes, then uh, we hope that it's a good Friday indeed. We start off with nature news. Uh, it talks about the environment, according to the nomenclature. Stakeholders demand implementation of 2021 Climate Change, Change Act. Uh, that's boldly written on uh, the nature news this morning. And that would mean that, hey, we need to move away from immersion of, uh, you know, the green gas. Africa's growth remains low, needs transition to low carbon economies, uh, that's what the World Bank is saying, but uh, what is the implication on our development? Then again, you find farmers embrace agroecology, seek support from the federal government. Federal government gives maritime operators $700 million for vessel acquisition. It dominated the papers yesterday. When the government to sell off Sunshine Stars and Sunshine Queens. Wow, what exactly is going on? Uh, we, we just move away from the nature news now and quickly turn our attention to the Guardian newspaper. National Stadium of Shame filled 31 months after $1 million uh, facelift. It's more like an editorial. Uh, you have this picture here of a national stadium uh, as it has been described. Former President Lushigo Basondro says 2023 polls shameful, urges next governor to end ethnic division. Labor moves says federal government uh, wants to cash in on 800 million palliatives. Uh, where government is saying we're sending 800 million naira with board, and we're going to use that to cushion the effect of the removal of subsidy in June. Questions over 12 billion airport fire tra trucks. I'll take that again. Questions over 12 billion airport fire trucks. And NNPCL heats at 400. 0.8 billion gas pipeline amid a push by Europe. Then, just before move away, confusion as Labour Party headquarters witness a siege and WC replaces our brewer as chairman. I mean, so there's a siege, and then you can't even see what's going on right there. The next paper we'll be looking at is The Nation, why Tunibu was elected by US based observer Mission. Why Tunubu was elected, U.S.-based observer mission is quoted to say, then you move away from that, Macron seeks China's action to end Russia's Ukraine war. Leadership crisis tears Labour Party apart. Ah, uh, okay. Former president urges, Lucia Gorbassinger urges incoming government to begin healing and reconciliation. Pressure on me to go into self-exile, be alleges. Oh, wow. Then you find no easy electoral victory again. Buhari tells politician. Mischief makers plotting interim government says the defense headquarters. Uh, that talk has been going on for a very long time. The Daily Independent newspaper says Niger more divided now needs national reconciliation. That's according to a former president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Lucia Gunoba Sondro. He says... Uh, He's too old to keep quiet over what in the country. Alleges Niger's leaders spend money like drunken sailor. Oh, that's a lot. I'm sure the sailors don't feel attacked. <laughs> uh, headsman kill 49 in fresh Benway community attack. That's a saddening one. Talks attack Labour Party National Secretariat in the FCT. We only recognize Abura as party chairman. So, I mean, the siege, we don't know if that's connected to the uh, internal wranglings that's going on in the party. Military will defend constitution against the interim government. That's what the defense headquarters is saying. We will not allow that happen. It says reversal of cash policy responsible for increase in kidnapping. So if this was going to, I mean, let's think about it. If the policy was going to help, you know, um, stop kidnapping and whatever, or reduce it to a barest minimum because we had witnessed, you know, some sort of quiet up until then. It feels like, you know, the notes again, especially the old notes are in circulation, uh, quite, quite worrisome. 
Buhari mocks governors who fail to make Senate after elections. Uh, I'm not sure the president will be that petty. Then again, you find Ekiti Guba Oyebanji hails Supreme Court's judgment reaffirming his election. Nigeria to build infrastructure for gas delivery to Europe. These are the headlines you find this morning on the papers. I'd quickly like to start off with um, the nature newspaper. I mean, that's what we started off with this morning. Jide Johnson, how do you respond to this? Uh, where stakeholders are asking the implementation of 2021 uh, Climate Change Act. And if we look at that, you know, demand, if you look at uh, what they're asking for, it might also have a huge implication on, you know, our environment in terms of our productivity and development as a country. Well, the, 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 the whole essence of the climate change is about the protection of the environment, to, pro to protect nature, to ensure that we maintain stability in the ecosystem and so that we can have survival of, of, of every, every living thing that is within the environment. So that's why the advocates of the climate change have, 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 have advocated that through our choices and through our decisions, we have further destroyed the ecosystem and there's a need for us to preserve it. And nations over the world, um, the, the, the most um, strategic decision was the Paris Accord in which many nations were part and parcel of it with the exception of the United Nations. United States that withdrew from the Paris Accord under Donald Trump regime. So, in essence, if you are part and parcel of an international treaty and then you come home, you domesticate it, you should implement the laws that you have passed. The problem with us in Nigeria is that we have a lot of laws that we have passed, we are progressive in our thinking, but it's the implementation of those laws that is usually the problem for us. Everything we talk about is not about the laws, it's about the implementation, the way to do what is required based on the extant laws that we have. So as far as I'm concerned, we signed the bill into an act in 2021, and here we are in 2023. They have not done anything to that, to that effect. And there are so many, there are so many acts of the parliament that are like that that we have not implemented, and it's just us not following through with whatever laws we have passed. That's the reason why we have had problems, either politically, economically, or socially. And there's a particular story which you talk about with respect to banditry and them kidnapping people demanding money because we create we had a policy a policy of um cashless policy new naira notes redesigned the rest of it to deal with the particular issue however the implementation of that policy itself created problems so we are nations of law but we are we are also in easy major contradiction we are nations of law we are also in nations that does not observe it law. so that's just the challenge which we have with respect to this. Mm. You know, but uh, I, I also like to ask you what you make of that. Yes, it's okay that we committed ourselves to, you know, this act or uh, whatever treaty it is that we signed. But when you juxtapose that with our behavior and how we survive as a country, do you think that, you know, it was really valid and rational that we commit ourselves to some sort of agreement when we know that we're still great on not 100%, but we're still very dependent on fossil fuel. We're dependent on a lot of this, you know, destruction of the environment for our own survival. And so if we take that out, it's not like we have a lot in place to cater for our needs. You know, to every, to, to every story, there are three sides of the story. There are advocates and there are pessimists. And then there are, there are those that are in the middle. Um, they are neither here nor there. On the issue of climate change, I'm neither here nor there uh, with respect to what um, the advocates have been advocating. Considering what you have just said, every nation develops at, at its own pace. What level of development do we have? In fact, when you are busy talking about climate change, you are not talking about poverty, taking care of poverty. If you look at the amount of money that has been invested globally on campaign on climate change, and we are much more concerned about the climate, we are much more concerned about the environment, but we are less concerned about poverty. A lot of how many people are living below the poverty line globally? So each, I think that what United Nations and the rest of all the advocates of this climate change should should, should, should first focus on will be on how to how to how to how to reduce because it's not possible to eradicate poverty, is to reduce poverty to the to the barest minimum. So where 
Where are you going to, if people don't make use of fuzzy fuel, if they don't make use of um, natural gases, um, they will, and in fact, majority of people don't even use gas, don't use natural gases or fuzzy fuel in Nigeria. They use um, charcoal and, and dead logs of trees to, 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 to cook their meal. So if someone does not have access to all of your renewable energy, renewable energy, what is he going to use to survive? So as far as I'm concerned, some of this campaign are just meant for um, when get, getting global attention and then looking for ways to direct funding to so that some people, some international civil servants can have access to some certain funds which they can use to, to, to pursue the campaign on their beliefs and their value system for some time. I, I, I think I was reading one story, I think yesterday or day before yesterday, when someone was saying that, um, um, when someone pointed out that they thought that, um, what's this coldest region, I remember, whether Greenwich or something like that, they thought that the, the carbon dioxide emission will abate the, 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 the green, Greenwich um, area to be, to be, to, 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 to be hotter, but it's become colder. So you have seen contrary divergent um, data and statistics from, 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 from the advocates and those that are anti-climate change campaign. So, as far as I'm concerned, the major concern for us in Africa is poverty, eradicating poverty, building better infrastructure, providing opportunity for our team youth that are unemployed. Rather than be talking about climate change, the climate, the climate change is the climate of opportunities that are available to them. No, but but Gina Johnson, you can also allude to the fact that you know we're complying. There's a lot of compliance. For instance, if you uh, you know live in Cross River State or you go to Cross River State, there's a lot of preservation of the green environment, trees and whatever. You have too many policies, you know, protecting the environment. Now, at the detriment of having, uh, you know, what you call them now, you have uh, companies, you have industries because you constantly have to protect the environment, protect the climate. And when we're not even contributing up to 10%, less than 3% of carbon emissions. So every other time I ask, should Africa or Nigeria be concerned about this? Yes, we understand that it's a global concern, but should we you know, be taking our necks in, in this conversation? The major developed, the major developed economy and the emerging global power, China, India and Brazil, what's the level of their compliance with this? Sometimes I just think that international civil servants just gathered, they look for one fancy idea and they play on that idea to, 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 to distract our attention from real, from real issues. What are the real issues? The real issues are the poverty level we have globally, the disparity between the North and the South. When I talk about the North and the South, in the global landscape, you are talking about the division between the developed country and the developing countries. So, the, the disparity, the lack of opportunities for 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 children of the south, and more opportunities for children of the north. And then we also see that we have also seen a, a, a very very serious immigration policy preventing movement of people, a, a preventing movement of people either. Uh, through legal or illegal means across the globe. So if you are much more interested in climate change, I have no problem with that. You should also be much more interested in 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 human in changing the human experience. That's that's my take. That's that's my that's my concern. For example, is the, if you if you localize it, you, you you spend if you look at the amount of money they spend on planting a tree, watering a tree. And then you look at the amount of money that government spends in providing health care, you begin to wonder. For me, I think sometimes some of these ideas are just opportunities for people to spend either global funds or local funds and the rest of it. That's I might be wrong. Now look at look at the energy with which we are um fashionable planted trees. How many government that came? I'm just using this as an example because you mean Fajola made EGMS made in planting trees. And then after Fashola's administration, which administration has made investment in, 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 in pursuing the green revolution in Lagos State, for instance, some of these trees that were planted, you, you just see, you, oh, every time you go, that are, you see people bringing out cutlass and cutting them off 
marketing them of cutting up these trees, some of the trees that are planted. So, you see, there is no consistency with respect to this climate change um, movement, one. Then two, my own major concern is that if you spend money on climate change, you should also spend on money on changing the human experience. That's that's my thing. There's a lot of fund that goes on climate change. If you see the funding that goes on it, if you see the amount of money, if you see when they gather to come, we, we've had so many conferences, so many conferences have been, have been and people that are advocate like like um, uh, our goal, like um, our goal, like uh, Bill Gates and the rest of them, they fly private jet, they fly private jet to their conferences and even the the CO2 emission from their private jets are much more than what... So there's a lot of hypocrisy when it comes to this campaign. That's just my take. All there's right. a lot of hypocrisy when it comes to this. Mm. Let, let's then turn our attention to the Guardian newspaper. The National Stadium of Shame filled 31 months after $1 million uh, facelift. This is the uh, National Stadium, is really right there in Lagos. I mean, is this sta uh, the stadium that was commissioned by General uh, Yakubu Gowan in 1972? Of course, in 1973, we had the games, uh, African games, where we actually, you know, won and what have you. And then it's, it's the same stadium that we're describing as, you know, that of shame and uh, filth. How do you feel about this? Jide Johnson, can you hear me? Oh, well, unfortunately, we haven't disconnected. Uh, I'm hoping that we have Jide Johnson connect with us in no time. Uh, I can't wait to share his thoughts on this particular headline on the Guardian newspaper that talks about the National Stadium in Surulere. Uh, then in Lagos, I mean, if you look at the glory and everything that has happened, what could have been responsible for such description? What could have really happened? Uh, what we had then and what we're having now and if you look at it is it something to write home about jd johnson do we still have you on the line uh, we just take a, a pause now when we return we hope to connect with jd johnson please stay with us jd johnson uh thank you once again for reconnecting unfortunately we got disconnected due to uh network issues right we hope that we get it better every other time but um, just before that timeout, I mean, I was asking what your thoughts are. The same stadium, the National Stadium in Surulere, that's in Lagos, that was commissioned by uh, the general then, uh, Yakubu Gowan, his regime in 1972, the same stadium that we had fantastic games, African games, and then, of course, we were topping the chart. You know, this same stadium that was described like the Mecca, you know, in Africa and what have you, it's the same stadium that we are saying is filthy, is a shameful one, uh, especially after those, you know, one million dollars are located for his facelift. What are your thoughts? How does this even make you feel? Mercy, I grew up, uh, well, I'm a Sulere boy. I was born in Sulere and then I watched so many games live in that stadium. I was in that stadium when Oparaji died. I witnessed it live and then um, I, 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 I had memories, fond memories of, of that stadium. And I know the power and the impact that sports can make and the difference it can make in the life of the youth. Just imagine if there's no basketball, if there's no American football, if there's no music, what will happen to millions of American, African Americans? Um, and government, successive governments since 1999 have not made any investment in sport. Any, not a... Imagine if there's no Premier League in, in, in... Look at the opportunities Premier League is providing to children of immigrants from Africa in, 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 in England and across the globe. And government does not even know the power of sport. And they just pay lip service to it. It's, it's, it's unfortunate. I was, I was at that stadium, I think sometime December 26th to be precise. And I was weeping because I knew how we used to, the fond memories of that stadium. And then you begin to wonder... People just open their eyes and then they watch national asset getting rot like that. It's just like the federal secretary at Twin Ikoyi. You know, the building is still there. Nothing is happening to it. For years, it will be there. And just like the national, just like now, I don't know why we need to build another national stadium in Abuja when we have one in Lagos. And uh, where you see states, countries usually exploit the strength of their nation. We had the opportunities. 
So if you could have the NDA in Kaduna, you could have other agents of government station in Kaduna. Why should NFF go to Abuja? Why should the sporting ministry go to Abuja? The sporting ministry could be in Lagos, Potter Court, or, or Ibadan. These are, and that's why you've seen that we have failed when it comes to sports. And sports, and I mean sports, is a major employer of youth. Is a major, 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 major employer of youth. And because you have neglected that area, just like you have neglected the facility, in the process, you have destroyed the opportunity for millions of Nigerians in getting in breaking through the poverty line. A lot of a lot of younger Nigerians have, 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 have taken their family, the extended family, out of the poverty line through sports. But what do we know? You know, some people build Lagos, some people build Nigeria, some people build Aquaibom, like they claim. You can't build this society if you don't provide opportunities for the younger generation. Mm. And sport is one of the major, major employers of labor. Thank God for music and entertainment. Just imagine, take music and entertainment away from Nigeria. Look at what music and entertainment has done. And that's why government should invest in this thing because a lot of teenagers that are roaming the street, they can go and burn their energy. Those that are fighting on the street will channel that energy into boxing or wrestling, into physical combat sport. These are things which are done. Imagine without boxing, where do you think Mike Tyson will have ended? Without boxing, where do you think where do you think Floyd Mayweather will have ended? Probably they will have been in prison. Even with that, with them engaging in sport, they almost they found themselves in prison one way or the other. But at least he was able to curtail them, make them to escape poverty. But what do we know? We don't know anything. We don't we don't know we don't know anything at all at all. It's it's it's, it's a shame. And then you build the national stadium in Abuja. Have you ever been to the national stadium in Abuja? That's another colossal waste. Where the stadium is built, it's not easily accessible. It's not in residential area, and it's at the gate of Abuja town. So when you when you and there's no public transport system that will take you from Abuja from the main city to the stadium. So if you go and watch games there, you become stranded. So why would you go and watch a game and become stranded and you get back to take you back home? So I I think we take ten steps forward. And then we take 100 steps backward. But when people want to be economic with the truth, when they want to help themselves, they come up with one idea or the other, and then they implement those policies, policies that you know is not going to work in the long run. And you can associate the failure of our national team with the movement of our team to Abuja, with the movement of the national stadium and neglect of sport in the last... What has happened to our teams, previous teams, underage group teams, and the rest of it? They are almost dead. We are now relying on importing foreigners to come and play for us. It's an unfortunate mercy. Mm. I, I like to ask you on, you know, the Daily Trust. That's, a, you know, there's a headline that talks about former President Olushagun who says Nigeria is more divided than it is now and it needs some reconciliation, national reconciliation. I mean, why has this, why is that the case? Why are we more, yeah, the Daily Independent newspaper, I beg your pardon, uh, this has become a very popular statement in our... It feels like it's going to become part of our lexicon. Because every other time we've had, especially after the elections, we have never been divided than we are. You know, prior to this time, Nigeria is more divided than we were before. Why is, is, is that, you know, the case? Well, um, um, there's one thing you can't take away from the military. It's about the unity of the country. They have a way of announcing the unity of the country. And there's one thing you can't take away from the political class is the ability to appeal to our fault lines, to appeal to our fault lines in order to seek and win control of government. If you check the voting pattern, the voting pattern from 1999 to date, the South has always voted one way, the North has always voted the other way. And um, if you want to see classic division, the classic division started in, in 2003, and then in 2007, there was no election as a lot of people uh, have agreed on to that effect. And then 2011, you discover that from 2011, the first election between Buhari and Jonathan, Nigeria was divided into two. Just look at the map. All you just need to use color coding for those that voted for Buhari and those that voted for Jonathan. You begin to see that pattern, that pattern of division. And then by 2015, you also see that pattern of division of the voting pattern where, uh, where Buhari won and where we are Article 1. If you use color coding for the state in Nigeria, you see the, this, this, this imagined pattern. So it's not a surprise when people are talking about this because politicians, they appeal to our sentiments 
um, because they don't have any policies. They, their campaigns are not issue based. If it's not my turn, it's if some people want to come and take over our state. If it's not, they don't want to come and take over our states. You know, you go, you break it down. If you break it down, you go to, for example, you go to, you go to a state, you go to a state like um, a state like like Benue State, where you have three major ethnic groups and some other sub ethnic groups. It's only one ethnic group. It is the TV that are still being being governor of that state. They keep recycling themselves. There's no involvement of other tribes like the Domas and the Gibis in in now. In, in Kaduna, for example, El Rufai tried Muslim Muslim ticket for the first time in Kaduna, where usually the deputy governor usually comes from the southern Kaduna and it comes from the majority of the southern Kaduna, but El Rufai picked a northern minority, a, 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 a minority, a southern minority of the same fit with him. And so when so when people talk about 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 that about that division, who should we blame? It's it's, it's about I, I stumbled on one of our bachelors and one of our bachelors, one of our bachelors speeches when he was starting his transition program. Everything he said about the political class, everything you think that Abacha is a saint. Everything he said, with them appealing to ethnicity, with them appealing to religious divide, and everything Abacha said, you think that Abacha is a saint. You'll be shocked. I, I was taken aback that indeed it's unfortunate that Abacha can't wake up from the dead. To come and share his own side of the story because everything he accused the political class of doing then is what they are doing now and one of the major reasons why babangida banned the presidential candidate in 1991 all of the reasons he had used in his national broadcast so they are nothing new they are nothing new because nigerian politicians they don't have any programs they don't have any issue they don't have any ideology tell me the ideology of the political parties any of the political parties. There's no ideology. Tell me any of the gladiators in the political space that has not moved from one party to another party. Tell me, there's none. Mm. So the, 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 the essence of seeking public offices is not based on ideology. It is based on fulfilling personal ambition. It is built some lifelong ambition. It is based on adding to their CV as far as some of them are concerned. But it's based on, oh, it's the turn of our region to produce what? To produce what for what? For who? If you really care about people, you make investment in the life of the people. Mm. But that, I, it is what it is. Let me use the common <laughs> plan. And some, people, and some people say that's very, you know, uh, common with the Jane Z uh, people. Well, yeah, yeah, let's, that's why I said let them use their time. It is what it is. Uh, GD Johnson, thank you so much. I mean, it's always a great time to have you on the show, share your thoughts on national issues. Uh, we wish you a good Friday and have yourself a happy holiday. Uh, you know, thank God it's Friday, miss. But, but this is a somber Friday. And we just, we eat something bitter. And then, <laughs> in memory of the death of uh, our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you once again. Keep mm -hmm. up the smile. Even in the face of the major issues we have in the country, we keep smiling. Yes. We hope for the best. Thank you so much. Uh, well, that's the size of it on Off the Press for the week. It's the final for the week. We'll return on Monday with more interesting headlines. Of course, we always have in-depth analysis to all of these issues. We take a break. Now, when we return, today is the International World Health Day. We'll talk some more, especially, uh, you know, with the consent health challenges in our sector here in Nigeria. Please stay with us. <laughs>